So now we're going to be starting on chapter seven, which has to do with work and energy. And we're going to start off by talking about what energy is. Energy is a really kind of challenging concept to define. It's not easy to give a definition for. Uh, but the good thing is, is that we can develop a working understanding of it by talking about it and by uh, going through this unit and understanding the calculations. And I think you'll have a really good understanding of energy. And even at the end of the unit, you still probably won't be able to put into words a really good definition of what energy is. So one definition that I use is the capacity to do work. And we'll see that in a lot of ways. So for example, if you have water in a lake, such as like out in Fort Meade, or Lake, I'm sorry, not Fort Meade, uh, but Lake Meade out in the west along the Colorado River. Um, it's uh, a huge man-made lake that we use and then the water uh, goes into uh, turbines and generates electricity. And so it has the capacity to do work. It can turn the turbines because of that energy that it has associated with being stored at a height and that's gravitational potential energy. We can also think of energy as a source of usable power. And so again, that same example would apply, um, but a different one could be, say, a chunk of coal. Um, coal has energy because it is a source of usable power. We can burn the coal and turn that chemical energy into thermal energy, and then turn that thermal energy into, elect well, mechanical energy and then into electrical energy. And so coal is a source of usable power. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about that. I don't really like to spend a lot of time dwelling on the definitions of energy. But energy uh, types, there's chemical. I talked about coal, um, wood. Um, lots of different things have chemical energy. Uh, thermal energy, that's the energy associated with molecules moving around quickly. Most people have a pretty good idea of that. Mechanical energy, uh, we're going to talk well, pretty much exclusively about mechanical energy in this chapter. Electromagnetic energy, such as from x-rays or infrared radiation that's being given off by objects. Nuclear energy, so that's energy stored in the nucleus of atoms. And we can release it through fission or fusion reactions. And then solar energy, which really solar and electromagnetic energy are should be in one category. Solar is really just an example of electromagnetic energy. All right, as I said, we're going to be focused on mechanical energy in this chapter, uh, but we're going to break it into two parts, kinetic and potential. And then actually we're going to break potential in, uh, into two parts as well. So we really have three kinds of energy that we're studying in this chapter, but they all fall into this category of mechanical energy. Later on in the semester, we will talk about thermal energy and then a little bit about electromagnetic energy um, in terms of infrared radiation um, as a means of energy transfer. All right, but for now, chapter seven focused on mechanical energy. All right, so as I said, we can break mechanical energy into two types. There's kinetic and potential. Probably been hearing about these types of energy since elementary school, but if not, that's okay. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. And we can look at potential energy as stored energy. So we have to remember that just because something's not moving does not mean it has potential energy, or just because something's moving doesn't mean that it doesn't have potential energy. Objects can have both kinds of energy at the same time, both kinetic and potential. Okay, so an object can have both kinds of the both of these types of energy at the same time. They can also have neither, and then they can have varying amounts. So we'll see examples of that. All right, so what has kinetic energy? A moving car, a ball that's falling, um, potential energy if something is pushed up against a compressed spring, such as the ball launchers that we used in lab. You have that little ball and you push it up against the spring, obviously there's the potential for something to happen there car at the top of the hill has potential energy. Now, as I said, things could have, could have both types of energy. So for example, the car 
it started to roll and it's say a third of the way down the hill, it has kinetic energy because it's in motion, but it still has potential energy because it's not at the bottom of the hill. On the other hand, if the car rolls down the hill and rolls along a flat place for a while and slowly comes to a stop, well, now it doesn't have kinetic energy and it doesn't have potential energy either. So they can have one or the other or both or neither. Okay. As far as potential energy, the two types we're going to talk about are gravitational potential energy. So that's energy associated with height and um, spring energy. And that's the energy associated with either a compressed spring or a stretched spring. There are a couple of links here and you all have access to these um, links as well. And so you can look at a demonstration of a pendulum or of uh, somebody on a skateboard. The um, skateboard is a, the skateboarding is on the FET website, which is by the University of Colorado. And it's actually an interactive and it's a really good um, way to get an idea about energy. And there's some instructions for how to do that in the remote module too. It should be like the second page in there right after the survey. All right. So the bowling ball demonstration that I would normally do in class involves, sorry, a long cable and a bowling ball, like a 15 pound bowling ball. And I would stand over here and I would hold the bowling ball up to my nose. So I'd pull it back and then I would just let go. And you can go and look up videos of this. Paul Hewitt is the, the one that I linked to in my PowerPoint. Uh, but there's lots and lots of physics teachers that have done this and posted it. And so if you let go, the ball swings out and then it, oh, well, it swings back along the same path. And it comes and it's, it's actually kind of scary to be standing there looking at it, but it flies back up at your face and it stops just about the same place, maybe just an inch or two lower than where you started, but basically the same place. And that is a great example of conservation of energy. While I do get nervous when I see it coming at my face just because of natural instincts, I know from a scientific standpoint that it is not going to hit me. Okay? The ball had a certain amount of energy when I brought it up to here. Okay. And then when I let go, the whole time it's swinging out and swinging back, it has the same amount of energy. Now, when it gets, say, down to right here, it does have less gravitational potential energy than it had before, and it has more kinetic energy. But the uh, total amount of mechanical energy is the same. When it gets to here, this that's the fastest it's ever going. So it has a large amount of kinetic energy and not as much gravitational potential energy. And then as it goes up, now it's getting less and less kinetic energy and more and more gravitational potential energy. And then it does the reverse and then it comes back. Okay, so the total energy in the universe never changes. Okay, so that's constant. We can say that Sorry, I think things are out of order. There we go. So the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. And so that's represented here with this simple equation. However, the ener energy of a system can change. Okay. And so for example, if I'm holding this bowling ball and I give it a push, I start at my face and I give it a push, it goes out and back. And then it is going to hit me if I don't move out of the way. And so the energy of the universe can't change, but the energy of a system can change. And so here I could say the system is the bowling ball. And if I give that a push, its energy is going to increase. And so let me bring up this equation down here at the bottom. Okay, so the initial energy plus the work that I did. Okay, so we'll get into that a little bit more later. But the work that I did 
is then equal to the final energy. So the ball had some energy because I'd raised it up to a certain height. Then I give it a push, which does work. So that's some number. And in this case, it's a positive number. And so then the final energy is greater. So final just means right after I let go. And then right after I let go, then that's the final amount of energy. And so then that final energy stays the same all the way across and back. That energy is not changing. It's, it is changing forms. The, the proportion of kinetic and potential changes, but from the moment I let go all the way until you know, it swings across and back, whatever, then the total amount of energy stays the same. But the initial was right before I pushed it and final was right after I let go. Okay, so we can increase the energy in a system. And that's what this term right here, this work term is to account for that. And we'll get more into what work is and what the NC means later. All right, so now we're gonna take this equation and this equation at the top is not on your equation sheet, but what we can do is we can say, well, what kinds of energy could it have at the beginning? Well, it could have gravitational potential energy. I could hold the bowling ball at a height. Um, the object could be sitting against a compressed spring or a stretched spring. The object could be in motion, have kinetic energy. So those are all the types of initial energy. And then we see this term repeated. And then afterward, well, what are the types of energy? In this chapter, we're really just talking about these three types, the gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy, and kinetic energy. And this equation, this seven term equation is on your equation sheet. It's a little bit intimidating, which is why I like to, to write it as I did here at the top of the screen. Even though that's not on your equation sheet, is a very simple way to think about what's going on there. We can also rewrite this seven term equation like on your equation sheet with a little bit, well, I say a little bit, it looks like a lot more, but it's really just a little bit more detail on what each type of energy is. But we're gonna get more into these later, um, possibly today or maybe tomorrow in terms of the type of energy. Um, the different types of energy and getting into the details of those. And all those definitions are on your equation sheet. All right, so what is work? Work is force exerted over a distance. So let's say you're holding, I don't know, something heavy. You're holding a suitcase that's like super loaded. And if you were, you're standing in line waiting to go through security and for some reason you've got this gigantic suitcase and you stand there and you hold it the whole time, that's gonna seem like a lot of work. However, from a physics standpoint, you've done no work. If you stood still for an hour holding a 100 pound suitcase, you're gonna be really tired at the end of that. You're gonna, your arm's gonna hurt, your shoulder's gonna hurt. You're gonna feel like you did a lot of work, but from a physics standpoint, you've done zero work because physics work is force exerted over a distance. And we have an equation for that, and that is on your equation sheet as well. So work is equal to F D cosine theta. So this is an interesting uh, equation. First of all, work, which a lot of times I'll use little hats on the W to indicate that it's a capital, uh, because we know that lowercase w, write this over here maybe, is equal to, I bet you know, oh. equal to weight. So we don't, get a, don't want to get confused between lowercase w and capital W, and we will be using both of those in this chapter. So this is work, and it is a scalar. Okay. And then we've got F, which is the magnitude of the force vector. Okay, so force is a vector, but here F is a scalar. Okay, and I know that can be a little bit confusing. Okay, so forces have both magnitude and direction. But when we go to calculate work, we only put the magnitude of the force in here. All right, and D 
is the magnitude of the displacement d. Right, d with the hat, the vector hat on it. Now, before we used delta x and delta y to represent displacement in chapters two and three, but here we're going to use d. And the reason that we're doing that is because that's what your textbook does. Okay, and that's pretty common for other textbooks as well. And so kind of like, well, why, why change symbols? But I don't know, but that's what your textbook does. That's kind of a common thing. So we're gonna, we're gonna stick with it. All right, and then theta is the angle between F and D. Okay, so F and D are vectors, and so they have direction, and we're going to define theta as the angle between those two things. All right, so cosine theta, if you look in your packet, we make a graph of cosine theta versus theta, and we start at zero degrees, and we go to 180, 360, and so on. Then at you know, 90 there and 270 there. So it has a value of one at zero degrees. And then by the time you get to 90, it's at zero. And then so this is zero for zero degrees. And then here is zero for, for the vertical axis. And then here's minus one. So by 180, it's down to negative one. Okay. So cosine is a function that varies between one and negative one. And then it comes back like that, and then it repeats over and over. But the important thing is really between zero and 180. It can be any value between one and negative one. And so if this is a scalar and this is a scalar, then cosine is the thing that's gonna determine the positive or negative um, aspect of the work. So work can be positive or negative. And that's an important consideration. And let's see if I can erase all this stuff that's on the screen here because it's making it a mess. There we go. All right. I guess I didn't need to erase that part, but anyway. Um, so positive work is when the force, or, or at least a component of the force, is in the same direction as the displacement. And so that causes an increase in the energy of the system. Whereas, whereas um, negative work is when the force, or part of the force, is in the opposite direction to the displacement. So just real briefly, I know I'm probably over my time that I said I was going to use, but if we have something and we were pulling on it, so some, whatever, a sled or something, and we were pulling on it, say, with a rope, and it was moving at a velocity to the right, and of course a displacement to the right, then T is not in the same direction as the displacement. But if we look here at this T sub X, it has a component that is in the same direction as the motion. And so that would be positive work. And the energy of the system would be increasing. If on the other hand, we had some object that was sliding to the left, okay, say, I don't know, say, say somebody was sledding and they were going down the hill and then they were going, they're moving to the left really fast and somebody grabs the rope that's attached to the sled and pulls in this same direction. Now, this is a case where part of the tension is in the opposite direction to the motion or and the displacement. And so then you'd have negative work. And so the energy of the system would be decreasing. 